Hi students, it's Mrs. T. We have made it to my favorite time in the semester, the second half of the semester. That means we can count down to the end of the term. We made it through midterm and now we are on the downward slide. Hump day, I guess, in academic terms. So we're starting chapter seven today. Chapter seven, eight, nine, and 10 are really covering the same exact topic as each other, just from different angles. So we're kind of lucky over the next few weeks where we get to focus on one theme and one theme only social stratification. Now chapter seven is all about social stratification in general, like explaining the background of it, explaining how societies work when social stratification is present, and also looking at social stratification in the United States. But we're also going to look worldwide, and that's what chapter eight does for us. And then we're going to use chapter nine and chapter 10 to look at some ascribed statuses that affect our position within the social stratification system in our society, the USA, but worldwide too. So we're going to go global in this unit, but we're going to all focus on all the information that we have hinges on the background that we get from chapter seven. And also here is our big chance to synthesize concepts from the beginning of the term. We spent the beginning of the term really just getting a whole lot of background information about sociology and we were synthesizing it together as we went along, but now we're going to be talking a lot about the socialization process, a lot about statuses and roles and the social facts and the norms that govern that so that we can develop our sociological imagination and see that connection between the macro and the micro. So we are really putting our brains to the grindstone here. Instead of taking brain matter off, we're adding some stuff to it, okay? So it's your chance to synthesize some concepts. You just have to put up with dorky Mrs. T for another little while, okay? So social stratification is about inequality in society. This word stratification means layers. They use this word in geoscience class or physical science class when you look at a cross section of the earth and you can see the core and the man, uh, the magma and the mantle, upper mantle, lower mantle, athenosphere. I don't remember what they all are, but you can, you probably remember in your mind's eye, you've seen at some point or another in a textbook someplace, a picture of the earth cut in half and you can see all of those different layers. Well, society is the same way. Um, society has layers also. It's a hierarchy. This word hierarchy is uh, means um, ranking. It means status compared to each other. So we've talked about what social status means, but some statuses have a higher social value compared to other statuses and yet and a lower social value compared to yet other social statuses. And you might see my hands doing this in the air. I'm glad my cat's not here right now because he would jump out of his chair and come attack me. But that's I'm trying to kind of like simulate this ladder in midair and, be, uh, you know, in, for the camera, you see this ladder on the screen over here, probably some of my best artwork to date. Um, but this ladder represents society as a whole, so macro scale society, and the individual rungs on the ladder represent these layers or the different ranking of different categories of people in society. Now, if you don't know right off what a category of people is or what that term means, go back to chapter five, those first few pages that I assigned for you before midterm and look that, um, look that word up or check out the glossary in the back of the book. Category of people is a huge social grouping, not a social group, but a social grouping of people within a population spread out across a population, but they have the same social characteristics as each other. So in this case of social stratification in the United States, the way that we categorize these people on these different rungs of this ladder that is a metaphorical representation of society as a whole, we're going to uh, look at three achieved statuses, achieved statuses. We're gonna look at three and we're gonna combine those to figure out what is your rank in society or what is a person's rank in our society. The three achieved statuses that sociologists use to look at the rank of people within the United States society or social structure is income, education, and occupation. Those are three achieved statuses. And so in chapter seven, we're going to look a lot at that in particular, and we're going to kind of filter out some of the other things that most definitely affect social stratification and social position in society, like 
the uh, scribe statuses that I mentioned we were going to cover in chapters 9 and 10. But for now, in chapter 7, we're going to look primarily at these achieved statuses, income, education, and occupation, because that's the social resources when you're reading the definition of social stratification at the beginning of chapter 7 in your textbook. You'll read something about access to or control of the resources that exist in society, the relationship that these different categories of people have to the resources in society, and how that affects their position on this social ladder. In the United States, we have an open system of social stratification. Open means that social mobility is possible, and that's one of the reasons, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the reasons I use a ladder and other sociologists too, this is not me being smart, this is me borrowing somebody else's smarts, um, other sociologists use this ladder as a metaphor for society because in our society, the USA, uh, we are taught, we learn in our socialization process that we are free to improve our income level by getting an education and toward a particular occupation that will give us that income level. Right? So we are taught that we should be able to be born here toward the bottom of the ladder. And remember, if we follow those rules that we talked about in the American Dream discussion that we had during week seven, if we follow those rules, we're supposed to be able to live the American dream. And the American dream involves working to get an education, working your way up through your occupation, so you eventually accrue or accumulate enough income and wealth, which means a specific thing in sociology, so that you can live a long life and at least enjoy a little bit of it toward the end. That's essentially the definition of the American dream, because we in the USA have an open system of social mobility. So look up that term social mobility in chapter seven, because that affects um, other people like outsiders, people outside the US. It affects their um, their uh, opinion of the USA. Why is the USA attractive to so many people who are born outside it and non-citizens? Because we have this idea that you can work to improve your situation in life. It's an open system of social mobility based on achieved statuses that all of us are supposedly, we supposedly, look, let me put that in air quotes, supposedly have the right to improve our um, conditions in life. Other societies, though, have what's called a closed system of social mobility. Um, those societies are usually based on ascribed statuses. That means assigned at birth so that you don't have control over society's label that's placed on you. Many societies, such as the caste system in India is based originally on religious categories that are part of the Hindu belief system. So if you look into the caste system in India, I can't remember if it's four or five different castes um, because I didn't really focus on that a whole lot in school, but I do know that it is a religious foundation and religion is a social institution that affects other social institutions. And since social stratification is a social institution, then religion is affecting social stratification in the caste system in India. Whether you yourself are a follower of the Hindu religion or not. It's going to affect macro scale social structure. Also, colonialism is one of the reasons why sometimes you find segmented um, groups within a society. Look at South Africa, for instance, and the apartheid system that was really in the news a lot in the 1980s and 90s, way before y'all were even thought about. But it was also a caste system based on the ascribed status of race. So these kinds of closed social mobility systems do not allow, there's a ladder and there's rungs on the ladder that you can use as a metaphor for those societies, but ain't no movement possible on those ladders in a caste system or in a closed system of social mobility. Open systems of social mobility are based on the idea that you should be able to work your way up, but it's your personal responsibility typically in these open systems of social mobility. So, 
uh, give yourself, I suggest you give yourself an entire page in your old fashioned notebook, if that's how you're taking notes on this, to draw yourself a ladder that we're going to refer to quite a lot. Now, sometimes our ladder will have seven rungs on it, like I intentionally put on here, but other times our ladder might have two, it might have five, it might have six, because there are various social theorists that we're going to look at, like we did with the, um, with the social groups section when we looked at Charles Horton Cooley and George Herbert Mead and others. We are, of course, going to look at additional sociologists and name them and describe what they said about why and how social stratification happens or evolves in society. Changes is what evolves means. So, Anyway, we've got a lot to talk about, some reasons behind social stratification, and also nobody asked me this question when we were in chapter four, but under ascribed status in that um, chart or that, um, that graphic that's at the beginning pages of chapter four, where you see society is made up of social institutions, statuses and roles, and social groups, under the statuses and roles in the ascribed status column, the textbook author correctly cites that class, social class, is an ascribed status. She correctly cites that. But ascribed statuses we have no control over, right? So even in the United States where we have a class system, our social class is ascribed to us. But didn't I just get finished telling you that these were achieved statuses? So what the heck? Well, you're going to have to tune in another time to find out what the answer to what the heck is. So please text me with questions and I'll see you again on YouTube. Bye.